welcome back to the Writer's Journey Podcast. I am your host, Mark Nadell. You are listening to episode number two. In today's episode, I have Liam Gibbs, and this episode was one of the episodes that were recorded some time ago, so it's audio only. Unfortunately, there is no video. Um, it's about his book, In a Galaxy Far, Far A Ride. This is his first self-published book. He's got six others on Amazon, if you're interested in taking a look. Uh, In a Galaxy Far, Far Awry, it is uh, comedy sci-fi, which he calls a mix between or cross between uh, X-Men and Spaceballs, <laughs> if that gives you any idea of what what uh, kind of book you're getting into. Uh, Liam and I, during this episode, um, we talk about his journey as a writer from uh, being a small boy writing stories about the cow eating grass <laughs> all the way up to uh, his journey through publishing and self-publishing um, you know how he approached traditional publishing and then eventually moved on into uh, self-publishing deciding that was the the best steps for him to take uh, so uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode it's going to be audio only after this but as uh, we continue to record a couple of authors away we'll move into uh, video for for future episodes Liam welcome to the show and thank you for agreeing to be part of it thanks for having me on so I want to start uh, at the beginning. Tell me when you realized that you wanted to be a writer. How did how did that come to you? That was a really long time ago, actually. I realized, I, I don't even know if you can call it realized. I actually just, uh, my this is uh, going on what my parents told me. Um, I was about four years old, and uh, at some point I just wrote a story about some cow going out and eating grass. And uh, no idea where that came from. But then my I guess my grandfather kind of saw this and said, well, you know, might be an author, and he kind of encouraged me, encouraged me, and so I tried it out in uh, grade school. I wrote, uh, you know when your English teacher says, you're going to write a short story, so here I went, wrote a couple short stories, and uh, actually had some fun with it, and it kind of grew from there. Cool, you were four years old when you wrote, what was it, Cow Eating Grass? Yeah, Cow Eating Grass, I don't nice. even know if it had a title. <laughs> or was it uh, a title? <laughs> yeah, I guess maybe that is a title. Again, this is going on what my parents told me, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't even um, I don't even know if we have that story around anymore. <laughs> How about when you uh, got a little bit older? Like when when did you decide? When did you think like okay, I'm gonna be start doing this? Like take it a little more seriously, and you started a little bit more uh, research or or school. Uh, we went to college together, so at some point you decided that you were gonna make yeah a bigger part of your life. Um, I think it was, uh, like in grade school, I'd written these, uh, you, you mentioned In a Galaxy Far, Far Ride, that's my kind of 99% of my writing. Uh, in grade school, I'd written some like kind of early stories of uh, this same universe, kind of the same, I'd like to call them the same characters, but honestly, the characters are so changed, it's uh, up to interpretation if they're the same characters, but it was the same universe, same kind of idea, and uh, I just, I kind of never let that go, I never let that universe go, because I grew up with a lot of uh, space operas like, uh, you know, Star Wars and Spaceballs. And uh, I wasn't so much a Star Trek fan. So I hope there's no Star Trek fans listening to this right now. Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, and things like Transformers and that, I guess technically that could be considered a space opera, maybe 50-50. Uh, things like that. Like, I grew up with a lot of that stuff. And, of course, I grew up with comic books. I don't know any kid in Canada who didn't grow up with comic books in the 80s and the 90s. Um, so, you know, things like Spider-Man, X-Men and all that stuff. And, uh, that's the stuff that went into In a Galaxy Far, Far Away, even as far back as these, uh, grade school projects that I was talking about. Uh, and those early stories kind of morphed into, uh, bigger novels. And these novels were, like, they were gigantic. They were huge. They were hard to edit. They were hard to, you know, for me to look at for the hundredth time, because every time... I would learn something. I would want. I would want to incorporate it into the story, um, some writing techniques or whatever. So I'd gone through these stories about, I don't know, twenty-five or thirty times, these seven hundred-page epics, and uh, got sick of those. And I took a break from those, and so decided to. We're still on in a galaxy far, far away. This is all the same universe, and uh, decided I was going to write kind of an origin story. I never started it. Uh, we kind of just threw ourselves right into the middle of the war. And so I decided I was going to show people how did the war start, like an origin issue, I guess, issue number zero. And uh, 
decided that this issue number zero was actually a lot better than the other stuff I'd wrote, written, so I tossed away all that other stuff and started over, and it, that issue number zero actually became what people know of as serial fiction sideshow. Edited that a few times, and uh, here we are, uh, probably, I'm going to estimate, about 2005, and I'd finished this story. And, uh, you know, decided it was great, and I'm going to do book number two, book number three, blah, blah, blah. And uh, mm -hmm. they're all just sitting around on my computer, kind of, you know, doing nothing. I'd shown a couple people, I'd shown you, Mark, uh, the stories, and, uh, you know, eventually uh, got on Facebook, and we're probably talking about 2014 now, and uh, saw somebody who had uh, kickstarted a writing project, and I thought, well, I'm sick of these com these stories just sitting around on my computer doing nothing. Uh, you know, I've always had dreams of publishing them. I sent them off to a couple of agents, but uh, you know, got got a couple of bites, but nothing nothing firm. Uh, why don't I kickstart my own project? And I did that, and that was 2015. And uh, voila, here we are. And then you know, five stories later, uh, I'm still kicking around. And you know, uh, I keep telling people at these. Um, sales expos and things that I go to that I've actually written up to number 19 now I've got. And people wonder, like, how did you write all of these stories? Well, you know, I explained these, these stories have been sitting around on my computer for 10 plus years. And so the writing bug kind of just grew from, it wasn't just a sudden realization. There were a few steps involved in there and I'd always carried it from, you know, from an early age, from grade school and all that, the same universe, these same characters that always, there are always these constants in my life. It's like, you know, the the uncle or the cousin that comes to uh, to visit every summer or whatever. Whenever I get a free chance, I'd go in there and I'd write these stories with these people. Yeah. And so it's kind of just never left. It just grew from there. Cool. Wow, 19 books. 19 books. For our, for our listeners that don't know what your books are about, can you kind of explain what, what genre, what, what they're looking at, what to expect if they pick up one of your books? Yeah, uh, so I mentioned that I grew up with, uh, you know, Star Wars and Spaceballs and all these uh, space odysseys, Transformers and whatever. And then I also mentioned that I grew up with, uh, you know, Spider-Man, X-Men, you know, Justice League, uh, things like, uh, I don't know if your listeners are, are aware of this one, like comic books, like What The, like we're, get, we're getting into like the niches of comic books, What The and New Warriors and things like that. And I just took all of these things and put them into this book series. So if you wanted... A rundown of what the book series is about. It's half space opera, half superhero comic uh, with just a ton of comedy in there. So it's a comedy science fiction. I like to tell people the elevator pitch is uh, X-Men and Spaceballs. <laughs> cool. So how do you balance uh, your storytelling with your joke telling? That is one. Do you find one more important than the other? Do you... Um, add in jokes to a story you're telling or do you tell jokes and put a story around a joke that you want to tell? Uh, every story is kind of different. Every chapter is kind of different. Every situation. It's easier to, uh, like with any comedy out there, uh, like if you're looking for the type of comedy this is, the type of humor, it's probably closest to space ball. So if you're looking at that type of thing, the cast is usually split between your straight characters and your goofy idiot characters. So I'm, for, I'm writing a goofy idiot character. It's a lot easier to put the jokes in there because the, the characters are the joke. So I can just write the story element and the jokes will take care of themselves. If you're writing one of the more straight characters, a little tougher. I mean, sometimes you get that kind of that joke inspiration and, and the jokes will take care of themselves and the story will take care of itself. But sometimes you have to write the story, and then kind of insert the jokes later on. So each chapter is different, each character is different, but you have sort of the same, you have the same end point anyway. You have both the story and the jokes, mm -hmm. and uh, you have to have both of them in there because nobody's going to want to read a book with no story, and nobody's going to want to come to see a comedy that's not funny. Yeah. So both of the elements have to be in there. It's just that the the you know, you might take the scenic route to get both of those elements in, or they just might take care of themselves. And do you uh, outline your stories, or do you kind of Stephen King discovery write as you as you go along? I do a bit of both. If I find that I'm getting to a point where uh, it's usually in Act Two, Act Two is 
90 percent of the time where a story will fail because writers kind of don't know what to do with the middle so if i get to act two and i find that i don't know what i'm doing i have to take a step back kind of reread all right what's already happened where's the story gone so far and then plan out some things but uh, i do prefer the stephen king method where you just kind of you know jump in feet first uh see what comes of it and then fix up all the mess later it's more fun that way anyway to me yeah yeah. are your books available any other languages have you uh uh not yet but i actually have the first book um being translated to french right now we're gonna see what comes of that and uh if there's enough of a market i might put some more translations in cool i was reading that um Germany was one of the second most popular or one of the biggest reading countries out there. Yeah. Um, yeah, and Germany might be next. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any plans for a, an audiobook? Uh, yeah, I looked into that as well. I contacted some uh, some companies and actually contacted some colleges to see if there were um, some students who wanted to kind of get some, I guess... Uh, Co-op work. I'm not going to really call it co-op because uh, you know I'm not an official company, but uh, you know just get some experience. And I'm waiting to hear back. Uh, some of the colleges we just went through a college strike, so it's been a while, and that might explain why I haven't heard yet. But uh, I'm yeah. going to be following up a bit. Yeah. Cool. I guess you'd have a lot of. I mean, you probably have a lot of. Do you have a lot of main characters, or do you have a lot of? Um, minor characters like constantly switching points of view? Uh, I have a bit of both. I have a kind of a huge main character cast and then some minor characters, but every story will focus on a select group. Uh, maybe five or six characters will be the main characters, and then the next story they'll be kind of shuffled off into the minor cast, and I'll bring some other minor characters forward. Cool. So from a voice perspective, would you be, just curiosity, would you be looking to have someone like one person read this book or would you actually try and get five different people to read five different personalities uh it depends if i can get an actor who can read different voices then yeah i'll hire that guy if he's good enough uh just to make all the voices distinct though i might you know have to hire you know three or four but uh that like I haven't gotten that far. That probably comes into the uh, interviewing stage or however you go about selecting your cast. Yeah. And so during your writing journey, um, are there any tools that you feel like you used or read about that helped you became become a better writer? Like, um, I know we went to college together, so obviously college played a role in in learning in learning you know, English and tools and whatnot. Are there anything, is there anything else that maybe influenced your, uh, your ability as a writer? Uh, I think uh, one of the biggest things is just to read other books. Like if you're writing, I'm assuming that a lot of your uh, audience is uh, fiction writers. So if you're fiction writing, you know, go out and read a lot of fiction. Go out, you know, you like horror, go out and read your Stephen King and your Dean Koontz and, uh, you know, whatever other horror authors you might like. If you're science fiction Uh, go out and read the science fiction books, you know, read the science fiction magazines. Uh, That would be kind of, I guess, the recreational type of learning, but there's also the, you know, the work type of learning. Like, don't rely, if you're going to college, don't rely on the college teachings to tell you how to write. You got to go and do your own independent research. Like, if you're stuck on a problem, you got to go and figure out how how do these other writers do it. Get on, you know, Facebook message boards or, you know, wherever you are, you know, call up a writing buddy, figure that out. You know, how do I how do I tackle this problem? How do I tackle that problem? Uh, things like that. You got to do your own research, and you got you can't rely on what you're being taught by other people and their curriculums. You got to find out for yourself how how do I make myself a better writer? How do I learn these tools? Cool. And um, just I just want to talk a little bit about going to your self publishing experience. Um, how did you decide you were going to self-publish? Uh, that was uh, it's kind of a hard question to answer. I guess it was that time that I saw on Ki- on um, Facebook that Kickstarter post. I decided, you know, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, it was always in the back of my mind, like, you know, 
when I'm sending these things out to agents and publishers, it's mostly agents that you send these things, these queries out to. Um, I was thinking in the back of my mind, you know what, some, I might actually rather self-publish because the difference between traditional publishing and self-publishing is that self-publishing, yes, you got to do about 40 jobs uh, to get your books out there. And chances are not likely that you're going to strike it big. You might, but probably not. Uh, with traditional publishing, you get the, you know, somebody else is footing the bill. Somebody else is taking care of all the legalistics and, and getting your copies out to the bookstores and stuff like that. But they take control of a lot of stuff. They might say, this is going to be your cover. We'd like you to change the title of this, uh, blah, blah, blah. So it depends on what you want to do. Do you want to take control of your project or do you want to let somebody else handle a lot of the jobs that you would otherwise handle? And I decided that uh, I wanted the control. I wanted to be able to dictate all of the aspects of my book. And uh, so that's kind of the final decision that I made, whether to uh, wait it out for a publisher to take hold of this or just go with a self-publishing route. And what are some of the tasks that you've found of a self-publisher? What are some of the things that you've had to cover? There's everything. you got to cover everything. <laughs> uh, you got to figure out, first of all, you're footing the bill for everything. So everything that I say here, uh, unless you know a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy, be prepared to uh, factor this into your budget. So you got to be able to uh, figure out what your cover is going to be. You have to research what are the most attractive covers. What are the covers that um, you know, are going to make your book stand out among the other millions of books? And what, what are the covers that are going to make a, a reader come across it and go, next, I'm going to take the next one. So first of all, the cover is one of the most important things that you need to put into your book. Because obviously it's the first thing that a reader is going to see. Readers do judge a book by its cover. Yeah. You got to research this thing. All these research uh, aspects that you never would have thought about. You have to figure that out. Um, you have to figure out who you're going to publish through. You have to figure out how am I going to get on Amazon? How am I going to get on, uh, you know, uh, Chapters, Indigo? How am I going to get on Barnes and Noble? How am I going to get on these big bookstores? Where am I going to sell? Uh, in person, because uh, in my experience, about 90% of your sales are going to be in person. So you got to find out, you know, how do I get into the local bookstores? Who's going to have me in for a book signing? How am I going to get my name out there? Um, you know, you have to be able to publicize yourself on radio, television, uh, podcasts like this one, um, you know, video channels like on YouTube and stuff like that. You have to go, you have to shake some hands, you have to meet some people yourself. You can't rely on the publishing uh, houses to do this for you anymore because they don't exist in your line of work now. Um, you're competing against them. You're not competing with them. Uh, so you have to do all of these things. So you have to learn, uh, you know, 35, 40 jobs or whatever. If you ever... I just recently got into a, a little thing about, um, you know, some copyright issues, uh, some discussions online and stuff like that, making me aware of some of the pitfalls of the copyright issues. Publishing houses will take care of that for you. They'll either tell you, okay, this is a, you know, you got to fix this up because we can get into some legal trouble. Or, you know, if you, you know, if somebody does do uh, strike a claim against you, they'll take care of it. They got the lawyers and all that. These are things that you have to take care of yourself now because there's nobody watching your back. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's all these countless jobs that you have to take care of yourself if you want to get your book professionally edited. And I advise that you do. Um, you have to foot the bill for that as well. You have to find out where the best deal is. Uh, you have to find out if they're good editors because you don't know. They might be trash. You might need to get some references for these people or, you know, find out some reputations and things like that. Um, you have to figure out how to create an ebook. I found it's weirdly enough. Uh, I found creating an ebook was one of the things with the steepest learning curve. I have, I'm not an ebook guy, so I don't really know much about ebooks. I mean, I I do now because you know I've had to go through that. Uh, but yeah, creating an ebook, you have to be able to do that yourself. The publishing houses will take care of that for you. But now you got to do that because again, the publishing house isn't with you anymore. Yeah. And how did you choose your editor? I always wondered, you know, it's not that hard to find an editor. There's a million of them online willing to charge you to look at your work. But how do you find one? Uh, I don't. actually do a good job. 
Uh, I went to a few uh, sites. Uh, one of them was CreateSpace. That's the one that I went through. And then they were, uh, they're not doing editing anymore, actually, though. So I got to find somebody else now. They just stopped, I think, at the end of January. Um, but uh, I went to CreateSpace and a couple of other places. I can't remember exactly where they were and kind of went through. And nobody reads the terms and conditions to any of these things. But for this, for my writing baby, I went through every paragraph of that terms and conditions, the 30-page document or however long it was, I went through that uh, and I weighed the pros and cons of each legal, uh, I guess, you know, the contract of what happens when you go with them, when you publish through them and when you get them to do their uh, editing services for you. That was step number one. Then step number two was uh, how much do they cost? Uh, and maybe this, is, maybe this is my bad, but I, I kind of, I didn't have any references that I could ask them for to uh, make sure that they were good editors. I had kind of had to go into that blindly, but um, I kind of assumed that okay, these guys, like for instance, CreateSpace is owned by Amazon. Amazon is kind of a big deal, so I assumed that they hired the best editors that they could hire. Uh, same with the other companies. Although I would advise somebody to kind of, you know, do a little bit more research on them than I did. I was kind of a it was kind of a stupid thing on my part. But um, do a little bit more research. Ask them if you can get some references. If, if they're a person, you, you know, definitely they'll be able to hand you some references. If they're a company, I'm not sure how willing they are to be able to hand off third-party emails and contact information to you. I'm not sure about that. But uh, just do some research and see, you know, first of all, like what books did they publish? Go out and find those books at the library or go out and see if you can get, you know, uh, previews of these books so you can see how the quality is, how, what's the end result. Yeah. Any surprises in the contracts when you read through them? Actually, no, they're pretty standard. Uh, so there wasn't anything... Like we own the rights to... No, they, uh, they, they were actually pretty adamant about making it clear that you own the rights to everything that you publish through them. That's not to say that all the contracts are like that, but at least the three or four that I went through were pretty adamant about making that very clear. Cool. So what are your thoughts now on, on traditional versus self-publishing? Would you go to a traditional publisher if you could? I mean, I've traditional heard, public... I've heard Sorry, that, keep going. Yeah, I've heard that um, from a um, financial point of view, you know, self-publishing, it is a lot of jobs, but once you pay that upfront cost, um, you make a lot more money because you're getting a lot more of the money back for your book. You get like 70% or whatever from Amazon. Whereas traditional publishing, you know, they're not, they, they don't, they know you're not Stephen King, so they're not going to give you, they're not going to put $100,000 into your book, you know, to have you on posters or around, you know, getting all this advertising. You're going to have to go and do it yourself just like self publishing. So, now that you have all the experience of having self-published, would you still think to go back, or what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think I'd definitely self-publish. Like in in terms of you're talking about the money, first of all, like uh, listeners, you're not gonna be able to quit your day job. Chances are slim, anyway. I'm gonna say that. Um, but you're right. Like the upfront cost is a big hit, but once you kind of get that going, you know. Uh, once you buy the copies of your books, so you can turn around and sell them. The ball kind of keeps itself rolling as long as you're smart with the money. You're not being stupid with, uh, you know, buying this and buying that. And I do advise people to um, make themselves a corporation so that way you can get some tax rebates and stuff like that along with this because you can't get any, you can't claim anything on taxes until the date that you open your own company, and that's a smart thing to do. So you can get some uh, tax breaks in that respect. Um, to answer the question, though, I think I would still go the self-publishing route, not only because of the control, but all the things that uh, the traditional publisher takes care of for you. That's almost like they're taking care of. They're taking away part of the fun. Like, you know, sure they'll get into the bookstores, and sure they'll they'll, you know, they'll kind of quote unquote sell it for you. They they're they're probably not going to pump you up as much as they would Stephen King. Like, let's let's be honest. They're gonna they're gonna advertise Stephen King a lot more than they're gonna advertise you. So all these publishing houses that claim, yeah, we'll get your book out there, we'll we'll make your name big. No, they're making Stephen King's name big. You still have to strike it big yourself. So that 
that's kind of a level field between traditional and self-publishing. But as far as going out and uh, them selling your book for you, I still like to go out to these sales expos and, and meet the readers and, and be able to talk to them and be able to sell my own book. Uh, there's a personal preference. You might not like to talk to people. Uh, you're going to have to talk to people, though, if you go the self-publishing route. But, you know, almost the, the traditional... The benefits of being with a traditional publisher is almost like they're, they're taking away your funds. So for me, I would still go the self-publishing route. The one aspect that I still like about the traditional route is they, they take a lot of the jobs for you, and so you're left with a little bit more free time. You have a little bit more time to catch your breath. Self-publishing, you never get to catch your breath. You're always on the go. You're always doing something. You're always rushing home from your day job so you can get that. Uh, you know, that next tweet in to advertise your book or, you know, try to take care of this thing or, or respond to that email. Yeah. So that's probably the one thing that I would prefer in the traditional publishing. Other than that, I still love self-publishing. Yeah, with traditional, I guess you get to go home and just start your next book and they, not that they Definitely. take care of everything, but they certainly cut down on the time. Yeah, I mean, there is the pressure of your book performing because you know, with a traditional publishing, if a book underperforms, they're probably not going to want to take on your next book. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Other than that, yeah, you get to go, go home and play more video games. <laughs> yeah. So did you just do uh, a single edit, or did you do a few edits when you work with this editor? Uh, by the time that I'd gotten into the editor, I'd already done, like, probably way more drafts than anybody would care to hear about. So my my thing was pretty polished by the time I got to the editor, but it depends on uh, what you pay for. There's some, I think every editing, I'm not going to say every because you know, I haven't checked every. This might not be across the board. It might not be true, but most editing houses will have several kind of, you know, editing packages depending on what you want to pay for. You can just get like the simple uh, line edit will there they'll go through and, you know, pick out missing words or missing commas and suggest paragraph breaks here and there and stuff like that. That's probably the cheapest. But you can get some that they'll go through the story and they'll give you suggestions about character motives and uh, things, chapters that they think should be in there or stuff that should be taken out, some pacing issues and stuff like that. And uh, those can go through maybe two or three rounds, depending on what you want to pay for. Yeah. And do you, what is what does kind of a budget look like? I know there's, I mean, you can get the best artist and you could find and pay five grand for him, but you wouldn't want to do that. What kind of budget would people be looking at if they were going to self-publish? Do you think? Uh, to self-publish one book and let's say to have like two edits on a little bit more than just just the grammar, you know, having someone look at story. Right. Um. Let me see. Uh, I'm trying to remember back to my first book. It's probably it's probably better to go to my most recent one. Uh, it was about, and I found somebody on uh, on DeviantArt who, to do the art for me. This wasn't somebody in a big art house, uh, you know, sitting behind a desk the whole time. So my budget for this might be a bit cheaper than what you would find with a, an art house. Mm -hmm. But I found somebody on DeviantArt who did it for about a hundred US, which translated to at the time about a hundred and 30 Canadian and then uh, for editing it costs I think now mine's a novella and they'll, they'll charge you by the words so keep that in mind so uh, my word counts uh, are a little bit lower than most people but it was about a thousand to get two rounds of editing for uh, for technical issues and story issues Okay. Uh, and then I also paid for kind of uh, somebody to do my the, the back cover blurb and that cost about 100 US, so again, about 130 Canadian. And then I did the ebook on my own, so I really don't know how much an ebook formatter costs. So I'd say about, I don't know, all told is probably I'll round it up to about 2,000 Canadian to get the book out there. And what is your, you mentioned novello. How many words is, are your books generally in their range of? Uh, I'm going to say about 50,000. It's easier to think of in terms of pages when you're working on Microsoft Word, and they'll be at about uh, anywhere between 120 to 150 pages. And uh, I think 
by the time it comes out, I think I quote people about fifty to sixty thousand words per book. Okay, so you're very close to a novel then. I mean, you're a bit shy of it, but yeah, I mean, technically it's a novella, but it can probably be a small novel. Yeah. And what are some struggles you've experienced in? Um, I guess let's start with writing your books. Have you had any struggles in writing your books? Uh, sometimes you just don't feel inspired. <laughs> sometimes, you, yeah, you just you get up and. Uh, mind you, I started the series probably around the time that I was discovering uh, staying out late and going and partying and stuff like that. But you might wake up the next day and just you just don't have enough sleep to do it. You don't have the energy to do it, and you got to force yourself to do it. There's sometimes. You know, I know everybody loves to write, but uh, don't get me wrong, writing is also a job, and you'll get to the parts where you don't like. Uh, that was one of the things, one of the other things was going through the millionth draft. Like, you're sick of seeing this thing, you don't want to go through it again, but you got to, because you got to get it polished. Especially if you're uh, sending it to the traditional publishers, they're going to want to see the best uh, product that you can give them, because they'll, they'll take one second, and if they find an error, they'll toss it out. Uh, so you got to make sure that that draft is perfect. You got to you got to go over every minutiae. Uh, one of the other things is uh, just getting over your fear of getting it out there and seeing what people think. Uh, not getting sued for anything you might have said that you're not even aware of. <laughs> what if what if the wrong person notices and you had a product placement in there that they didn't like? You don't have the backing of uh, lawyers to uh, help you out on this one. You got to figure this out on your own. Uh, there were a couple of chapters that I actually had to change that uh, I didn't. I really didn't want to. I held on to the last possible second, but I had to actually change the wording in a couple of chapters and kind of dulled some jokes, I think, in my opinion. But I don't know. I guess I'll let the readers determine that. But uh, anyway, I didn't just didn't want to get sued on that stuff, so I had to change the wording. Because you told a joke about a company or a business or something. And... Um, I actually had, and I found out recently that actually I could have done this because of something called fair use. Because mine is considered a satire, um, I'm allowed to actually put small excerpts of, uh, like small appearances of characters in there. And there was one chapter, it was a construction site, and, and there was one chapter where uh, I actually had the constructor cons show up, just kind of a pop in. You know, like something like Family Guy has a character kind of walk in. Mm -hmm. I was wondering how Family Guy got away with it. I just assumed lawyers, or they actually contacted companies to make sure they got the permission. But anyway, I, I took that out because I didn't want to get sued by Hasbro. Uh, I had actually tried to contact them, didn't get anything back, so the last second I decided, all right, I'm going to rewrite this part. And I did, and I found out actually recently that I could have left it in because of what I said was fair use. It was, you know, like um, the excerpt was small enough, and I wasn't saying anything about these characters that the company themselves hadn't said already about them. So uh, it would be would have been considered satirical, and I could have left it in. So I kind of re-released the chapter on my website uh, the way it originally was, but it always kind of it always kind of kind of twisted at me that I had to take that out and I had to had to redo the chapter because of that. Is that something you you consider almost republishing, like at least for an online version? Uh, I I probably wouldn't because. I mean, the people that have already bought the book, they kind of helped me get to where I am now, right? Like, I wouldn't have published a second book if nobody picked up the first. And so I always feel like it's almost like when you re-release an album of a, of a band that you like, and they all have all these B-sides and all, uh, stuff on there, and it makes you rebuy the album. I don't want to kind of do that to no. my readers and making them either they rebuy the book or they miss out on this content, so... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I didn't republish it. I just released the uh, chapter on the website. People can read it for free. Cool. And going back to the uh, struggles with writing, you mentioned sometimes you have to force yourself. Do you have any advice on how to get past that? I mean, I think every writer has felt that. But sometimes, I mean, probably what makes someone who will actually finish a book versus someone who won't is actually writing when you don't want to. Is there anything that you do or anywhere you go that sets you up to do it or do you just sit down and get to it because yeah you have to uh i mean some people argue that you're not inspired when you don't really feel like it and that's true and it's legit and sometimes you can bow out because of things like that but you can't do that every time so sometimes you actually do just have to sit down there 
write something that has no inspiration and then you know, go back and fix it later. That's what later drafts are for is when you have inspiration, you can go in there and give the chapter life. So if you don't feel like it, you know, sit down and do it. Maybe go for a walk first. Uh, you know, watch an episode of a show that you like that will get you in the mood. But when it all comes down to it, if, you know, if you don't feel inspired, you still got to get this thing going. Yeah. Still got to put some mileage on that book. So, you know, sit down. The, the thing that makes or breaks a writer is when they realize this is work, this is the work part of this, the, the job, and I still got to do it, yeah. even if I don't feel like it. Yeah, I just had a flashback to when we used to uh, write for a while and then go outside and throw frisbee, and we were terrible at frisbee. But oh, we're terrible at frisbee. <laughs> that was our our way of. We actually got some noise complaints too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it, uh, it worked. I mean, we went right back into the. We got right back into it like a half an hour later and and started yeah. again. So that worked. Um, any struggles on on self publishing that could save someone uh, looking to get into self-publishing sometime, like anything that you learned? Uh, the one thing I learned is if you're scared of doing something, uh, do it. Do it faster. <laughs> uh, I don't, I can't pinpoint any one specific thing that I was, you know, scared of doing. I guess the most frightening experience for me was actually just starting and going. And, uh, you know, I, I've heard about some writers, and I know some writers, and, and, you know, you meet writers that come, I'll call them writers, because anybody who writes is, is legitimately a, a writer, in my opinion, you don't have to publish something, so mm-hmm. I've met writers at these sales expos, and they come up to me, and they go, you know, I, I've, I've got this book, and, uh, you know, it's, it's an idea in my head, and I just really want to get it done, but, it, you know, it's been sitting there for like 10 or 12 years, and the single piece of advice I tell them is just sit down, write that thing, and when you're finished writing it, Go back and review it. Review it as many times as you think you need to. And then just get it out there. Don't be scared. Just go in with blinders because fear is what's going to stop you. It's gonna, that's the difference between the published writer and the guy who just wants to be published. Yeah. You get over that fear, you know, be brave, and just get it out there. And how was it like when your first couple of reviews came in? Is that, I, mean, I imagine you're always hoping everybody wants a five-star rating. Any I should have been uh, I've been pretty lucky. I've gotten some, the first, I'm not going to count the first reviews that I've gotten because the first reviews that you get, they're always from people you know and they always want to say nice things about you. It's always going to be your neighbor or your mom or the person that, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. don't count the first couple reviews. The first couple reviews that I got from people that I didn't recognize, I was lucky and I think one of them was 4.5 and the other one was 5. They actually liked it. Um, these were people that I, I did meet them online and I, I did give, I did sell them the book and uh, some of these were actually Kickstarter uh, backers. So you, when you're doing Kickstarter, you always got to give them the rewards and the most common reward is the actual product when it's done. And so I shipped them and, and they'd reviewed the book and I was pretty lucky to have some good reviews on that. Uh, I did get one mediocre review from a, from a video channel on YouTube. And uh, I actually did agree with a lot of what they said. There were some things that I didn't agree with. Um, some things that I kind of thought, did you, you know, there were some parts in there that I actually addressed the issues you were coming up with, but they did make some valid points. So that kind of softened the blow, you know, kind of turned into a learning experience. Yeah. But you have to, that's the thing about bad reviews or, or at least mediocre reviews. You have to kind of grow a callous heart and, Use it, it. You have to kind of ignore it, and at the same time, learn from what they're saying, so you can make a better, uh, better story later. Yeah, cool. I like that advice. Um, and how about promotion? How have you gone about promotion? I know it's one of the most difficult things. What separates sometimes a lot of big authors is just who knows about their work. I remember uh, listening to a podcast on a writer. I don't remember who it was, but she was just about to give up and throw in the towels. She wasn't selling the books, even though she had put money into it. And somehow Oprah had gotten a hold of her book and put it on her Oprah book club and brought her onto the show. And, and now she's like, she was like a number one bestseller. So how do you, how do you go about the promotion? I mean, it's, it seems like a very difficult thing to do. 
Uh, I'm by no means an expert, but uh, I do know some things that uh, I think can help people out. First of all, uh, again, do some research on how to do this stuff. I mean, you're competing against millions of other writers, so uh, you know there's no problem with personal experience, but there's no reason why you need to bump around in the dark. Go out and get a couple books. Uh, read about how to do this both in stores and online. Um, what I do is uh, I'm on pretty much every social media platform I can tolerate. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. And it's, some people, I give them, give them my business card and they flip it over and they go, how can you be on all these social, like how can you be on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and Instagram and Google Plus and stuff like that? Honestly, uh, a lot of what I put on Google Plus and, and uh, Twitter and stuff like that, it's it's all identical. I write one post and stick it on everywhere. I might have to, you know, tailor it because I know Twitter has a character count and Instagram has pictures and stuff like that. So there might be some differences. But honestly, I'm on every social media platform I can tolerate that I can sign into. Um, there's that. Uh, so again, though, just, you're going to... Sorry, do people just look for you on... Is that what you're... Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Make sure you have an identical uh, username on all these things. So if somebody finds you on Facebook and they rather find you on LinkedIn, they know exactly what to type in to find you. Okay. But, yeah. Um, other than that, though, I encourage you to uh, find other local writers in your area. Uh, team up with them. You know, a lot of the times, yeah, it, is, it isn't what you know. It's who you know. Uh, get some tips off them, find some connections, get yourself on television and, uh, you know, the radio and stuff like that. And uh, why I segued from finding other local writers to that is because I don't think that I would have been able to get on TV or the radio without some suggestions from the writers that were already through that. They've already connected with some people and they gave me some email addresses. I'd tell them I sent you. Uh, so that they're... they're you know, you can't go wrong by finding other writers who will be able to help you out and be able to give you advice on this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, you, you're going to need to get on TV. You're going to need to get on the radio, podcasts, uh, newspapers, uh, wherever you can go. Um, you know, because it's not just about who you can contact, who you can pass out a business card to. I mean, if you're getting on TV, suddenly you're in front of everybody's, you know, living room. Uh, anybody who's watching, like, you know, getting on the uh, big uh, network stations in your area, getting on to even, you know, college radio and, uh, you know, finding a thing on there, just looking busy, being busy, constantly trying to find out where you can go and where you can advertise your book to. Have business cards that you can pass out. You go, oh, and, you know, whenever I see somebody in a Star Wars t-shirt, I go, Look, looks like you got a Star Wars t-shirt. Looks like you're a Star Wars fan. Here's a business card. You might be interested in this. I, I wrote this. Get your website so that when you do pass out the business card, people have a place to go to get all the information about where you're going to show up next, how they can sign up for a mailing list, uh, anything that you want to pass on to them. You know, links to preview chapters of your book they might want to check out, where they can buy the book online and in stores as well. Cool. And then, uh, of course, speaking of stores, get in stores. Um, you know, go and go and meet the uh, managers in person. Uh, I used to find that a lot of stores, you know, they'll probably get an author in there every couple of days, and by the time you show up, they're rolling their eyes. But actually, a lot of them are very hospitable. If you uh, know how to sell your book, uh, if you get out there and, and you're very animate about your selling, they love for you to come in time and time again. They love, they always have a local author section. They'll put yours up at the front. They love to have you in. They love to kind of show off the local authors. You might think they're all about business and they just want to sell their product, but actually they're very encouraging about local authors and getting some local talent in. Cool. That's good to know. Are you talking places like Chapters and stuff? Chapters, yeah. Like um, all the big stores, actually. Chapters is probably the one biggest store in this area, but um, you know, Barnes & Noble would be the same thing or whoever you've got in your area. What about libraries? Are they, have they been helpful? Uh, libraries, I've actually had to approach them, and I've gotten my books into uh, into uh, our libraries here, and uh, they'll take a copy. But you have to encourage yourself. You have to, sorry, you have to present yourself as, I guess, um, you know, Canadian content to get in, because they're they've got limited shelf space, right? They can only hold so many books, 
And so they gotta, you have to justify why your book should be one of the books that's in there. Um, and it's not, it's not that hard to justify yourself. You just got to show that, you know, this is why I'm Canadian content. I'm a local author. Uh, this is my, you know, this is, this is the book size. This is the number of pages. This is who it's aimed for. This is the audience, you know. Um, some people around here have found it, uh, you know, to be a good read. Uh, and, uh, you know, I encourage you to put it into this section, and this is why. And uh, it's usually it's all it takes, and you might have to uh, follow up them to make sure that they did read it, but, um, you know, I've gotten all four books in there, and I'm about to uh, drop off the fifth one to see if that'll get in. I don't see why not. And uh, so it's, it's pretty easy. You just have to justify why. Cool. You mentioned earlier um, getting books promotion do you have any books in mind are we talking marketing books or what kind of books? Uh, I don't have any one marketing book in mind and I have to uh, warn you guys these marketing books can be really dry you have to force <laughs> yourself to they're super dry but um, I just went on to uh, Amazon got some you know the the most the cheapest most beat up copies of these books I could find there's some idiots books out there that will uh, that you can find online, or just uh, if you just type in, you know, marketing uh, businesses, I guess, or whatever keyword searches you can think of, you'll probably come up with a, a few books and just pick up the most uh, likely ones. Just be warned, though, that uh, if you're looking for something that's specific to brick and mortar stores or something that's specific to online, um, I don't think there's really a lot of books that are specific to exactly your situation i found that um you know how do you grow your facebook followers well it's going to tell you about search engine optimization for your website and you have a lot of chapters on that so you're going to have to kind of pick apart the parts that are applicable to you yeah okay and where where can your books be found uh, my books can be found online at uh actually just type uh, any major book selling website, and you can probably find it. Um, and I say this because uh, CreateSpace is your friend. If you get it on CreateSpace, your ebook will be literally everywhere. Um, as far as the paperback copy is, you can find it on Barnes and Noble, Chapters, Amazon, both the U.S. and the uh, Canadian site, and I think things like the German site and the Netherlands site for some reason, Japanese, even though they're only offered in English. Go figure. Uh, yeah, the, the British site. Uh, you can find the paperback copies on there for books one to four. Book five just recently came out. I think I clicked the big launch button about a week ago. So it takes some time to filter down into the uh, to the satellite stores, and that's what that's kind of what the terminology is when you talk about these websites. Uh, so it might be there when you when you check it out, or it might actually just say coming soon still. But uh, as far as uh, being able to drop off into a store, if you're in the Ottawa area, uh, you can find it at Chapters Canada. You can find it at Chapters um, in Gloucester. And uh, here's a big warning. They're opening up at Chapters in Orleans. And Chapters Orleans, I'm coming gunning for you when you're open. You can find it there hopefully soon. You can find it at uh, Books at Beachwood. And if I'm counting right, they've only got one copy left. So I can imagine... Everybody's rushing over to books on Beachwood right now, uh, and Kessel Run Games, which is actually kind of a kind of a kooky little Star Wars inspired game and pop culture store near the Plasterlines Mall. And I'm going to be looking at getting into a few uh, libraries across Ontario and a few more bookstores. Right now, it's just in the Ottawa Public Library. So if you drop off in there and you want a free read. You can uh, you can find it in there. They got a copy of each of the first four books right now, cool. and uh, I don't think I'm missing anything. Awesome. Any uh, any future projects you have in mind when you're done the series? I mean, I guess you have 19 books, so your work's cut out for you for the next yeah years. But do you uh, have any plans to write anything different? Any thoughts? Uh, I have been kind of toying around with an idea of taking a break, but uh, I'm not sure if I actually do want to take a break because when you do start a project. Like, I don't want to ban it because it's a lot of wasted time I could have spent on my main project. So, still thinking about that. But, um, yeah, people keep asking me, like, when's, when's the end of this? Like, how far are you planning to carry it? And I keep telling people, I'm going to keep going until I'm either bored or dead. So, <laughs> as far as in the galaxy, far, far away goes, how, how long is that project going to go? I have no idea. 
I got, like you said, I got 19 books. I still got some stories left to tell, and, and yeah, who knows? Yeah, when people get bored of it, and you know, sales start to slip. If that ever happens, I might just, I don't know, keep them to myself. Who knows what I'm gonna do? <laughs> cool. All right. Well, that's all the uh, questions I had for you. Thank you for your time. No problem. Thanks for having those. me on. That was a wealth of information. Thanks a lot.